Chapter 1. Orientalism. The Orientalist, Oriental, and the Orient with Occidental Trappings. Just before the joint American-British invasion of Iraq, news outlets were on the hunt for Orientalists. These individuals have garnered academic knowledge, either by scholarship or through some brief stint in the Middle East, Orient. There were a handful of Orientals, Eastern natives, living in the U.S. at the time. However, most Westerners are yet to recover from the post-September 11 shock. Hence, the discrimination that swayed in alongside al-Qaeda's adventures makes it unlikely for any Arabian to go on U.S. media. For ratings' sake, they'll most likely be denied thoroughfare at the door of famous media houses. Nonetheless, the American people would love to understand the kind of people with whom they're dealing. In the end, they settle for the Orientalists with their skewed, though sincere, view of the Eastern cultures. The Orientalist is the scholar, the Orient is the rich Eastern precincts, while Orientals are the occupants. Europe had a jolly colonial ride on the Asian continent and, in the process, gave European intellectuals a skewed view of the originality of Oriental culture. These intellectuals seem to understand what Oriental culture should be instead of what it is. These pseudo-academic views are often faulty, irrespective of their knowledge and good intentions. In his scholarship, the Orientalist implies that the Orientals, Arabs and Asians, are incapable of self-definition. To this end, the subconscious imperialist drafts the Orientalist history and culture from a distorted and bird's-eye point of view. For every person without a cultural identity, there will always be someone to dictate not just what they think they are, but what they should be. Unfortunately, cultural discrimination is not limited to the West alone. Even the natives of the Oriental Middle East are apprehensive of having any relation with subjects that bear the Americanism tag. Arabs are often blinded by the unchecked control the West has over their countries to appreciate American society for what it is. Conclusively, the two sides of the Orientalism meniscus happen to be faulty. Judging an entire community or nation based on the nefarious actions of some Islamic extremist, diehard white supremacist, or racist intellectual is the wrong way to go. Instead, we all need to understand individual personalities and how they interact with their local society. By inference, we need to know how they adjust and overlap with entirely new civilizations and cultures, particularly in this era of globalization. There are several things that miss us due to seeing people and the world from a myopic perspective. This summary will help you open up your worldview and understand the major ideologies that shape the modern world. Chapter 2. The Absolute Categorization of Orientalism and the Defining Factors A story was told of a colonialist who spent 25 years in Oriental Egypt, serving in various administrative capacities. The meticulous and unflinching poise of this colonialist at serving the British crown won him an illustrious reception in Britain after his retirement. The day of his official acknowledgement by the Queen arrived, and he was required to give a brief address. The entire narrative of the colonialist gave a warped and distorted caricature of the Egyptian culture. British decision-makers in the audience, many of them having no opportunity of an Egyptian pilgrimage, believed the tales of their century. At the peak of colonialism, only a few Westerners had a first-hand experience of the East or a scholarly exposure to their culture. This category of people is called Orientalists. They are adept at drawing up an intellectual body, detailing what they call the Middle Eastern or Muslim way of life. Such narratives make a breakneck effort, sometimes honest ones, to explain why Orientals behave the way they do. Orientalists are concerned that Orientals lack a mind of their own, and even if they did have one, they are incapable of exercising their cognitive powers. Such rationalizations are the mindset behind canonizing the history and culture of a people foreign to us without seeking the input of the people concerned. 
Maybe some of the agitative tendencies of such Orientals are correct. However, can we prove them to be true of every member of that society? So far as the United States seems to be concerned, it is only a slight overstatement to say that Muslims and Arabs are essentially seen as either oil suppliers or potential terrorists. Edward W. Syed Orientalism as a field of study began as multiple branches of scholarship before its eventual unification. With origins in the early church, the then scholars made an effort at understanding the languages in which Eastern religions were rendered. Though priority was given to the Mosaic languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, Arabic, Sanskrit, some other Eastern languages came into the spotlight. This early exposure to the Eastern languages gave Western scholars the illusion of understanding Oriental culture. What the Church Council of Vienne, 1312, started as a field of learned study is today a significant determinant of the Orient's worldview. Chapter 3. The Fallacy of Establishing Entities on the Strength of Arbitrary and Theoretical Knowledge According to history, the narrative has always been that of the West getting drawn into the Oriental culture. However, there are also efforts by the colonialists to regenerate what they met as the Eastern way of life. However, despite the short-lived success of Western colonial dominance, there is a point of friction that has always been unresolved. Islam The apprehension of Islam is not far-fetched. This religion has several things in common with Christianity and, dare said, it has gotten a bigger following than Christianity. So much that Islam, at some point in history, threatened to dominate significant portions of Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte was wise enough to patronize the sensitive Islamic ego of Egypt. Bonaparte's fraternization was to win over the Islamic Egyptians' loyalty by communicating with them in Arabic and giving an impression of being pro-Islam. A careful perusal of history makes the West seem almost paranoid of Eastern culture's richness, so much that the East has influenced the West more than vice versa. Napoleon left Arabic serfs as the governors of Alexandria and Egypt's entirety before his departure for Europe. Europe was not only a key gateway for the West to the East, it equally served as a window into then-unexplored Africa. The contributions of intellectuals decorated the landscape as encouraged by Napoleon. However, many years afterward, the West continued its adventure of recreating the Orient. They did this through Ferdinand de Lesseps, who ventured on constructing the Suez Canal in 1882. The common impression is that the West is the pioneer of such a unique project. Meanwhile, ancient Egyptians have embarked on projects of similar scale in medieval times with no external input from other civilizations. From the beginning of Western speculation about the Orient, the one thing the Orient could not do was to represent itself. Evidence of the Orient was credible only after it had passed through and been made firm by the refining fire of the Orientalist's work. Edward W. Syed the West is guilty of finding an easier way to understand the Oriental mind through literature than actual interaction. However, perhaps the error is not a sign of ignorance on the part of the West. It could be an effort to enforce values, suppress what already is, and wield authority. That is, subtly imposing what ought to be true of the Orient while selectively ignoring the established entities. Chapter 4 Societal Redefinition of Beliefs and the Engineering of Values Gustave Flaubert's incomplete work in Bouvard et Pécochet is a thorough reflection of Europe's intellectual metamorphosis. The title analogizes the West's futile efforts in developing various bodies of knowledge only to renege into depression. After pursuing several facets of expertise, Bouvard settles for becoming a copyist, to which his partner equally agrees. Flaubert further satirizes the future of Europe, claiming to see Europe as regenerated by Asia. By regeneration, Flaubert means the liberation from the driving force of materialism and mechanism which held Europe spellbound over the years. Eastern domains like 
India, and the Middle East seem better at controlling their whims and avarice than the Occidentals. Hence, if Napoleon's Eastern Expedition, 1798 to 1801, opened up the East, scholarly works on Orientalism did the groundbreaking. Scholars like Sylvester de Sassy and Ernest Renan were significant contributors to the foundation of Orientalism as a field of study. In learning the cultural dynamics of the Orient, the West remained meticulous in its pursuit of knowledge. All facets of science and philosophy were enjoying unprecedented developments. This advancement created a subconscious power dynamic which the Occident soon came to realize. The power dynamic was exploited in colonizing a large portion of the Orient as it laid a false impression of incapability on Orientals, all thanks to the knowledge gap. The impact of Sassi on the initiation of the Orientalism cult was no small one. Though he started as a copyist, his early exposure to Oriental texts gave him the best experience of the Eastern cultures. Sassi was consulted on several occasions for the drafting of the annexation proclamations of several Oriental nations. To do philosophy is to know things. Sassi took hold of Oriental texts, copied, digested, and transcribed them with occasional commentaries. What we today have as Orientalism, which is at a parallel with the actual realities of the Orient, is a function of Sassi's philosophical poise. With Arabic poetry as a case study, Sassi's commentaries infer that Oriental poetry is of little value until refined and put forward by a Western mind. Ideas, cultures, and histories cannot seriously be understood or studied without their force, or more precisely, their configurations of power, also being studied. Edward W. Syed. Chapter 5. Requirements for Oriental Adventure and Pedagogy. It takes a highly sharp, critical thinking ability and actual knowledge of the Orient to discredit the popular prejudices embodied in early Orientalism texts. The pioneer scholars of Orientalism limited their assessments of the Orient to manuscripts and drew some semi-vivid imagery from an account of pilgrims. Sassi and Renaud's likes make up their intellectual treatise by juxtaposing such accounts and eliminating the differences. The enigma then rests upon one's inability to deduce the presence of prejudice or scholarly aptitude in these Orientalists' intellectual efforts. Orientalists are mostly uninterested and incapable of discussing individuals. Instead, abstract entities predominate. The subject's reservations screened some accounts by pilgrims who visited the Orients in the 18th century. Still, it can offer more insight into the Orient's richness and values than some intellectual sitting at the copyist table of a notional remote abbey. In the process of extracting the everyday observations of English and French pilgrims to the Orient, students of Sassi, Renan, and other birds of Orientalism are unable to appreciate the contrasting point of view of various Westerners. The early Orientalists' account is a scientific stereotype drawn by selecting standard demarcations of individual pilgrims. These diluted views give a terrible impression on most readers of materials authored by Orientalists. Indeed, even some Western elites caught the flu, thus causing them to choose imperialism over a cultural unveiling. The subconscious belief that Orientals lack the cultural view and intellect required for self-governing is foundational, all thanks to the likes of Sassi and Renan. If only they knew their works would significantly impact global integration, perhaps their foundational contributions to Orientalism would have received more liberal philosophizing. Chapter 6. Mutability and the Lump-Sided Outlook of Orientalism Behind the vast volume of scholarly work that has gone into the flushing up of Orientalism as a field of study is the subconscious outlook that has slowly crept in and polluted the innocent meaning of the word Orient. There is a wrong depiction of Orientals as delinquents, the insane, women, the poor. 
Another broad outlook among most Orientalists is a disdain for Islam that varies from mild to extreme. Consequently, the abstract exploration of Oriental cultures via texts graduated into the Orient's physical colonization and imperialization. Edward Syed talks about Orientalism in very negative terms because it reflects the prejudices of the West towards the exotic East. But I was also having fun thinking of Orientalism as a genre, like cowboys and Indians as a genre. They're not an accurate representation of the American West. They're like a fairy tale genre. Craig Thompson. Soon enough, factions of fact began to arise among Orientalists. In the wake of the 20th century, the Occident and Orient were involved in more instances of actual interactions. These interactions brought about rising tensions between the West and East. The confrontations are a product of the dissonance that exists between narratives of latent and modern Orientalism. To date, the inability to come to terms with the variations between accounts of classics by the likes of Sasi and the present-day Orient made room for the West-East friction. One of the greatest influencers of Orientalism is the mildly persistent sense of confrontation. Maybe, just maybe, if there had been no field of study called Orientalism, East and West could have sorted out their differences. One may have seen the other for who they are, accepted and lived with the reality. However, many wars have been fought, and the canvas of the battlefield is smeared with red. Hence, the variance seems irreconcilable. Chapter 7. Find a way out of the many faults of Orientalism. The Orientalist of today is not a strict adherent of either purely latent or manifest Orientalism. The basic framework abides by implication, making the dispositions of classical Orientalists reasonably valid. However, Orientalism of the 21st century mimics the prevalent intellectual, economic, and political realities. The early ages of Orientalism, and even recently, saw the Orient being treated as a sociological lab rat. Equality was never the object of the Orientalists' discussion, as they perceive Orientals as inferior in intellect and culture. Orientalism was insensitive to its effect on the human experience. Sir Hamilton A. Gibbs testifies of the enormous leaps that Orientalism took in the 19th century. Eastern poetry, for example, is no longer being studied as an intellectual appendage, but for the sake of appreciating its uniqueness and richness. We need to admit that no single scholar or thinker can be a perfect Orientalist. Perfect here refers to not having any form of cultural or religious bias, thus shaking the foundations of previously held beliefs. Various pop cultures have, however, cropped up in the West that identifies with the Orient. Nonetheless, the alignment is almost always a caricature, if not outrightly comical. Since Homer's time, every European, and what he could say about the Orient, was a racist, an imperialist, and almost totally ethnocentric. Edward W. Syed. Conclusion A forthright Orientalist is not necessarily pro-Islam or jihadist. They assess the situation as it is. Mental laziness and lethargy are likely to dispel scholars in the philosophical fields due to justice to Oriental research. It is often easy to slide in and flow along with the ebb of long-lasting stereotypes. Furthermore, the backing of authorities like Sassi and Renan may seem enough despite the submission's obvious fallacy. There's more to the East than Islam, Jihad, terrorism, and cultural reservation. Likewise, there's more to the West than supremacy, colonization, intellectualism, and science. A little dose of all individual extremes is found in every society. Though we cannot deny the frequent occurrence of certain vices in some climes than others, the ubiquity might be a product of the intercultural frictions that have been fueled by misinformation and stereotypes. We should strive to focus our lens on what connects us as humans as opposed to our differences. In doing so, not only can we challenge the Orientalist and colonial aspects of traditional photographic narratives, 
but we can also create a new visual legacy marked by equitable discourse. Nita Satam. The essence of analyzing and assessing Orientalism's persistent influence is to fish a way out of the wilderness into which it has wandered. The contemporary scholar should be able to look beyond screens of stereotypes. Also, there's a need for emancipation from all detached biases about the cultures that may fall within our Oriental case study niche. Try this. Make efforts to identify the many stereotypes about foreign cultures that you might have condoned without checking the facts. Subsequently, endeavor to assess people you meet based on their values and experiential character. Before arriving at a conclusion about an idea or individual, you may want to ask yourself the following questions to avoid going down the lane of stereotyping. Does the idea in question profile people of a certain race as having a particular character trait? Do you get uncomfortable when you have to team up with individuals of another gender or race for professional or social interactions?